Good afternoon. I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today. Um, this is a beautiful group of people. I just want you to look to your left and your right and just be in awe of who you are sitting next to. Oh. It's incredible. <laughs> Um, wonderful. So as I mentioned, my name is Mira, um, <laughs> and I'd love to today talk to you about a word called risk. I think we've all been asked and posed, what do we mean when it says to take a risk? Why take a risk, and, and how do you do it? Well, I'd love to tell you three stories, three really big moments in my life that were incredibly risky, um, and then share with you how I did it, what I failed and learned, and then what I hope to impart to you all. So what is life without risk? Ooh, let me go back for a second. So just to begin, I want to set the stage and paint a picture for you. I am a daughter of immigrant parents. My parents moved from India to the United States at a very young age in pursuit of higher education and better job opportunities. They left behind their entire family, support network, friends, everyone they knew and everything that was familiar to them to pursue that. Um, and so at a very young age, it was instilled in me that education and a really good job in like three industries is what matters. Um, and I remember summer vacations was spent doing math in the morning. Like that was what we focused on, was how quickly can you do multiplication? Um, and I remember that was very, very deeply important to me as a way to succeed and also make them really proud. And so at the age of in 2007, I graduated from a women's college with a degree in economics. And I was off to New York City for a job on Wall Street. And I was going to be able to live in Manhattan. I was going to crush it. I was checking every box. My parents were so proud, telling all their friends and family, like, she's going to Wall Street. Look at her. And I felt really, really proud as well. Um, but. Something was really missing. I remember I would put on that Brooks Brothers suit in the morning, get on the subway, walk into my Wall Street office, and feel completely out of place. I didn't fit into this all-male club. I couldn't talk to them about the sports games that they watched the night before at the bar, or the dates that they were going on, because I wasn't. <laughs> and I just had no way of connecting and contributing to the discussion. But I also knew that this was the dream job. I was working in Wall Street and living in Manhattan. Like, what more could someone want at the age of 22? And so I was like constantly struggling with, do I dig in and figure out a way to make this a career for myself? Or do I eject and go do something else? But I was also young, and living in New York can be an overwhelming experience for anyone. And so I started to feel the stress of the job and these decisions that were weighing on me, and friends were like, I think you need to take some time out to, to take care of yourself. And so someone suggested yoga. I was like, I think that's supposed to be good for you. Let me go practice. And so I found a beautiful studio. I really felt connected. I was unrolling my mat a few times a week, starting to really take time for myself. And it was there that I started to cultivate this inner deep question of like, well, what am I doing? And as I started to practice, I started to feel like I could let go. I could just be with myself. Whatever emotion was coming up, the stress of the job, it didn't matter because it was happening outside of where I currently was. And I decided that I needed to change some things. But what I really loved was yoga, and I couldn't reconcile how I was going to have a career in finance with student loans and go off and try and do yoga. And so, I started to think about how I could incorporate this into my life. And what I realized was I wanted something more in the yoga space. I wanted to take time for myself and self-discovery. And so before social media was a thing and before Instagram promoted companies and brands, I found a way to go study the tradition, the richness, the lineage of yoga. And so I did the unthinkable. I quit my job in finance in the peak of the recession, mind you. It was crazy. I packed up, and I went abroad to India and Southeast Asia for a year. It was nuts. Like, no one even knew where I was. I had no way of telling my parents, this is a school I'm going to go study at, because there was really no online presence back then. <laughs> um, and I got to India, found an apartment, lived above a cafe, and I was having the time of my life. I was waitressing, 
very different than working in Wall Street, and exploring myself, what I wanted, practicing, breathing, and taking those moments to just reconnect. And it wasn't like the answers were coming naturally every day. There were moments, and I remember one really distinct one. I went to an internet cafe because I was so cheap I couldn't afford internet in my apartment. I logged into the New York Times and I saw a headline that said Lehman Brothers had collapsed. And I was like, oh my God, what did I just do? I made the worst decision. And it was hard to not want to go home, to book the first flight back, to go back to my old job. And I considered emailing my old boss to be like, I've had a change of heart, I'm coming home. <laughs> but that was the best thing because I was able to actually feel what was coming up, like the fear, the anxiety, the dread, the questions, and see what I, how I was reacting and responding to that and where it was really manifesting in my body. Um, and the love for the yoga continued, right? I wanted to continue learning this tradition. And so I went to Thailand, I backpacked around alone as a woman also, which is also very scary in that time, and was getting ready to figure out what was next. And I knew I wanted to come back, but that year made it really clear that I needed to want a career that was gonna make a big impact. And the natural decision would have been like, well, just go back into finance. Like, why wouldn't you do that? That seems like a logical decision. But that didn't feel right. And this inner voice that I had begin to, begun to listen to and cultivate kept making it clear that that wasn't the right decision. And so it led me into education. And I found an organization, three of them actually, um, that I worked with to help change the status quo of public schools in New York City. And to give you context, New York City has the biggest school system in the United States. There's one million children in there, and most of them are stuck in failing schools because of the structural challenges of the government. And so I went in and did some awesome work. I added 6,000 new seats, I opened, I think, 22 new schools, and I closed a few hundred as well. It was that critical of work. But, as much as I loved it, and as awesome as the accomplishments were, that voice was starting to, starting to chirp again. And it was like, what, there's something missing here. And to be completely honest, it was actually a comparison thing that was happening. I was starting to look around at my friends, my peers, and seeing how much money they were making, how impactful their work was, and I was starting to feel the bureaucratic pull of the government. Things that would take other people like three months to roll out took me three years. And it was hard to not want to compare and to look at those friends and be like, where, where am I in comparison to you and how do I stand up in front of you? And I was also wondering, how is this actually gonna to contribute to my life? And so I started to try on a lot of different things. I tried to move to San Francisco. I tried to move to LA. I interviewed at firms all up and down the East Coast to try and change something. But as I tried on all of these different things, nothing was really clicking for me. And that inner voice kept coming back to say, something needs to be bigger. You need to change something fundamentally. And that was like flip it entirely on its head. It can't just be a new job in a new industry. And so I made a really, really big decision. I moved to Berlin 11 months ago to a city I had never visited. When I got to Tegel, that was the first time I was ever here in Berlin. <laughs> and I was beyond floored that that was the airport I was gonna be flying in and out of. <laughs> I could see my luggage from the immigration line. I was like, this is so weird. <laughs> I had no network. I had no friends. I had no job. I had one person that was with me, and that was my husband, who was willing to take the risk with me as well. And I remember feeling this like, sense of dread and anxiety and excitement on the flight over. It was like, have I done something completely crazy? Or is this gonna be a really good opportunity for me? But I knew that that inner voice that I had really developed and started to listen to back in New York was still with me even on the flight over and even when I got here. And at, when I first landed, I was like, where do I start? Where do you start when you land in a new country? I don't speak the language either. And so I spent the first six months 
trying to click out of the New York City mindset of just go, 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 doing things because I'd been so accustomed to doing them. I started taking German classes. I was emailing people off of Facebook to meet for coffee friend dates. Like I was that stepping out of my comfort zone because I had nothing to lose. I had just moved my life across the Atlantic. Um, and I spent that time also practicing this, this, this practice of yoga, like connecting to who I was, what I was looking for, and trying on different things, different companies, different friendships, different people, different neighborhoods of where to live, and trying to feel what was really right and what clicked for me instead of what was clicking for everyone else that had told me what their experience was. And there were so many skeptics in my move to Berlin. Telling my family I was picking up and leaving was, was hard. Um, telling people that I didn't have a job was met with so much skepticism. Thankfully, we had a few months in the bank of savings from New York that I could rely on that to kind of give me a little bit of a cushion. And it was through that that I met people at Omeo. And that is the company that felt completely right for me. I put that on, I felt it, I walked around in it. I was like, what does it feel like to actually walk into the building at Omeo? How do you feel when you walk in? What's happening? Where's my gut? And it felt really right in comparison to everything else I had also been trying on. And so, I ask you, or I leave you with three things that really worked for me, which was build and foster a connection to yourself. It's those quiet moments that you go inside and you take out of the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of your life to really listen to what's happening to your body, where are things getting stuck, where does your heart feel, and how does your heart feel? How is your mind reacting to this idea? And then create space and time to reflect. That could be any type of practice that you do. Writing, as it was mentioned earlier, journaling, cooking. For me, it was yoga, and it was that unification aspect of the breath, the mind, and the energy that was flowing that I felt really, really strong. And then listen to that inner voice. It will always be with you. It will never leave you. And the more you pay attention to it, and the more you actually question and engage and discuss with it, as crazy as that sounds, the more it will help unlock and, and show you answers that you may not have seen before. The decisions that you're facing may become really obvious and clear in those quiet, introspective moments. And hopefully that allows you to take that risk, to jump into something completely unknown that sounds crazy and looks crazy on paper, that you have to justify to everyone around you. But when it's coming from a really deep-rooted place, it doesn't feel that overwhelming. So thank you.